Hi, everyone. Welcome to IMAPEC's first webcast of the Corona 360 In Conversation live interview series. I'm Kashmira, your host for today, representing IMAPEC Singapore. A little bit about us. IMAPEC strives to be your one-stop shop for biopharma industries, business intelligence, and networking opportunities. For over 10 years, we have established ourselves firmly as a trusted organizer of high quality biopharma B2B conferences and exhibitions in the Asia Pacific region and beyond. Over the past six months, we have exponentially expanded our portfolio to include virtual conferences, digital marketing solutions, market research reports, and now our webcast series. Kicking off the start of this series is the discussion on Asia's SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development challenges. As you know, the COVID-19 cases have been climbing. At this point, past 4.1 million infected worldwide. And many companies are racing to find a successful vaccine at unprecedented pace, looking to achieve one in 12 to 18 months. Of course, with such a tight, a deadline, there are plenty of challenges and the Asia Pacific region uh, comes with its own unique set of challenges as well. This, is a, this discussion hopes to bring light to some of the key hurdles and strategize possible solutions for them. To all our viewers and to our panelists, thank you all for taking the time out to be with us here today. In addition, I'd like to take a moment to thank our gold sponsor, BIA Separations. I'd like to share a little bit about BIA Separations. They are the leading developer and manufacturer of SIM, convective interaction media, monolithic chromatographic columns. These resolve stubborn difficulties encountered by traditional particle-based chromatography and resulting in significant valuable improvements in yield, quality, and costs in downstream processing. They have over 20 years of experience and with over 500 running projects. We are very pleased to have them on board with us. Today's session will feature an introduction from each interviewee, followed by the panel discussion. We will then have a 10 minute presentation from BIA Separations. This will be followed by a Q&A session. You may use the chat feature on the right-hand side of your YouTube screen to submit your questions real time. And we will address your questions at the end of the uh, panel discussion and presentation. Please note that you will have to have a YouTube account to submit your questions via the chat. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. First, we have Dr. Bin Wang. Dr. Bin Wang is the founder of Beijing Ad Vaccine Biotechnology, China. He is the director of the National Engineering Lab of Therapeutic Vaccines and a distinguished professor at the Department of Medical Microbiology and Parasitology at the Fudan University School of Basic Medical Sciences. Dr. Bin Wang, I'd like to hand over to you to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your company, as well as the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development efforts uh, that you guys are currently working on. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, thank you for the uh, nice introduction. And uh, my name is Bing Wang and uh, I uh, work uh, two places right now. One is a Fudan University and the serve as a professor I'm doing mostly uh, research and uh, some uh, uh, graduate student teaching. And uh, at the, that place, uh, I'm mostly focused on the vaccine development and uh, uh, adjuvant uh, research. And um, in 1991, uh, we, uh, we found the ad vaccine uh, company at Beijing. And right now we uh, have a, a subsidiary uh, company called uh, Advaxin Pharmaceutical 
at the Suzhou, and uh, this is the uh, office I'm uh, right now in Suzhou, uh, China. And this company is mostly focused on, uh, mostly focused on advanced or more uh, innovative uh, vaccine technologies. And uh, based on the uh, novel adjuvant discovery and also uh, uh, antigen, uh, novel antigen discovery for uh, unmet and mathematic needs, uh, such as uh, RSV. Recently, we have uh, developed a novel RSV vaccine for pediatric and uh, uh, elderly people. And those, uh, those vaccines uh, has been uh, conducted in phase one clinical trial and also going to move to phase two. And um, I have said that uh, mostly uh, we are focus on the uh, immunoregulatory uh, pathways and to design the, uh, to design the vaccine, particularly uh, for like RSV since uh, in the history, uh, we know the uh, formerly killed vaccine has a problem to in enhance the pathogenic diseases uh, in lung and uh, resulting the uh, uh, hybrid of uh, uh, disease we call uh, vaccine enhanced the disease. So we, we developed a novel technology able to induce in T-Rex cells to suppress the overreactive T cell. And then in terms to suppress also uh, VED, uh, vaccine enhanced disease. So that's also one of the uh, example of our novel uh, vaccine technology has been developed. And for the COVID-19, we are uh, partnered with the uh, American company called Innovio Pharmaceutical, which is the, uh, the world leading DNA vaccine technology uh, in that area. So uh, we co-developed this uh, COVID-19 uh, DNA vaccine, and we hopefully we can move this technology and the product into, uh, into the market potentially currently you, in US this is a, uh, this uh, product already tested in phase one and in China we just submit our ND and they're still waiting for a uh, response from our uh, regulatory bodies. Thanks. Yeah, uh, you did mention to me that uh, this past week you've been working on your IND submission so it's been quite hectic for you. Yes, very busy right now, yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Vin Wang, for uh, your introduction. Now we also have Dr. Ella with us. Um, Dr. Krishna Ella is the Chairman and Managing Director of Bharat Biotech International Limited, which is one of the leading innovative R&D companies with 45 global patents, of which five are for new molecules. So Dr. Ella, I'm going to hand over uh, the time to you to share a little bit about yourself and your company, as well as Bharat Biotech's work uh, on the SARS-CoV uh, vaccine. I got it. Um, thank you very much for uh, being a pan panelist here. And thanks to other uh, colleagues here. And I think um, I studied in US, came back 97 to India and set up uh, this company. And I believe that we want to be innovative. That's a very important strategy for us as a company. And uh, we believe in public-private partnership, truly. And, uh, and public partnership and private-private partnership. And I think we developed more than 16 vaccines. And uh, we are, at least I'm thankful to the Gate Foundation and Welcome Trust, uh, more than $165, $170 million uh, gave us uh, funding, a lot of clinical trial program. Uh, otherwise, I would not have grown. Uh, to this level. And I want to acknowledge that uh, because I'm a, being a new entrepreneur without much help from the government here in India, you don't get a help from the government, but we work with this sort of uh, international agencies. And I think um, Rotavirus is a good success story. We work with uh, CDC, NIH, Stanford, you know, and Government of India and multilateral. And the second important success story that we made, Tybot TCV is the first true conjugate vaccine, first time in the world. And we have done Oxford human challenge studies. And then we have done effectiveness studies 
in uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, Burkina Faso, Malawi, and all the other countries, Vietnam, and other files. So that shows that we are integrating into the global public health point of view on effectiveness. And also truly, we are one of the leading pandemic vaccine developers. Why I'll tell you that one good example, uh, we were the first one in India to make H1N1 in less than 10 months uh, when the government of India wants in 2006. And in 2009, we were the first one to make a chicken gunia vaccine, which now thanks to SEPI funded us. Now IVI is going to do the phase two, three trial in the Philippine and uh, Thailand. And then um, we were the first one to Zika vaccine global pattern. So that speaks that our breadth of knowledge on the pandemic vaccines. Uh, so I think uh, we are developing three different vaccines now on COVID. One is uh, with the University of Wisconsin, Coroflu. And we're also working with Thomas Jefferson on rabies backbone and the inactivated vaccine. And third is a live inactivated vaccine. Since we have BSL-3 containment facility, we're also making a live inactivated vaccine right now. That's the situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ella. Um, now moving on, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Dong Xu Chu, with, uh, who is with us today. Dr. Chu is the co-founder of CanSino Biologics. He is uh, he has around 25 years of experience in the biotechnology industry, having led several rounds of corporate financing as well as technology transfers. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Dong Xu um, to actually uh, share a little bit about himself as well as his company and the work that they're currently doing. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the Dong Xu. Uh, I'm from. Uh, uh, called Cancino Biologics is from uh, Tianjin, China. Uh, the company was founded in the 2009 by four of us found, uh, our founders. Uh, I'm one of them. And uh, for the last 11 years, uh, we have de developed 16 uh, products. Uh, currently, we have one product approved uh, by Chinese government, it's the Ebola vaccines. We have two in the NDA stage. Is the two meningi uh, conjugation uh, vaccines? Uh, we should get approval sometime this year. And we have, uh, uh, let me see, five, uh, six products now in clinical trials, mostly in phase one, phase two, and they include this uh, uh, COVID 19 uh, vaccines. Uh, we have uh, uh, about 38,000 uh, square meters of uh, manufacturing facility in Tianjin. <clears throat> with seven uh, product lines. We also have about uh, 12,000 square meters R&D centers also in Tianjin. Uh, I give you a very short uh, introduction about uh, this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Uh, our product is a recombinant novel uh, called the Kono, uh, Kono virus vaccines, also called the adenovirus type two vectors. Uh, we use antigens as protein of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, i give you a little bit of summary uh, to give up one slide I can uh, share with you. Uh, just, I just read this. Uh, for R&D development, we established the pilot skill uh, drug substance and the drug product process. We also established QC testing method. Uh, for toxicity studies, we complete the tox studies in SD rats and the spinal mongoose monkeys. And this product is safe in animal models, test under three human dose at a high dose level. Uh, we also complete the immunogenicity study in the mice, guinea pigs, cinnamongus monkeys. And this product is immunogenic in animal models and can introduce strong humoral and cellular immuno response. Uh, there's also dose uh, correlation. Uh, we also complete animal challenge studies in the mice, ferrets, uh, research monkeys, and the result demonstrate the protection uh, effects. We also complete the pilot skill CN CTFs manufacturers. We do the three batch at the 25 liter at this moment. And it's both this release by the uh, ourselves also confirmed by the, we call the NIF NIFDC. This is the government body. And uh, we start, we call the first in human phase one trial in China with 108 subjects 
starting in March 16. And with the three dose, three dose, uh, we call the low dose, middle dose, and high dose. We also start phase two clinical trial study in April. This is about the 508 subject. This is double blind, uh, flexible controlled studies with three group. Uh, so we use low dose and middle dose, also control groups. Uh, one more uh, news is like a CTA application to Health Canada for phase one, phase two, uh, adaptive clinical trial in Canada has been approved. So we should uh, start our clinical trial in Canada version. Uh, that's uh, basically a summary for my, my part. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chu. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Exler. Um, Dr. Jean-Louis Exler is a pediatrician and vaccinologist with 29 years of experience on HIV vaccine uh, clinical development. He is currently at the International Vaccine Institute as program director for new initiatives. So Dr. Exler, I'd like to hand over the time to you to uh, share a little bit about yourself and IEBI's work uh, on the SARS-CoV-2 va vaccine. Thank you very much to you, to Imapak, to invite me. Uh, this is a great opportunity to discuss with other colleagues. And uh, I would like to congratulate my colleagues, uh, at least those, <laughs> I'm sure the others will also give a, a nice uh, overview. Uh, for their work and their dedication to this important task. So um, I have been uh, working at IVI since um, 2000, uh, end of 2015 uh, as head of clinical development and regulatory. I was based in Korea, but I have to move for family reasons to Malaysia. So I live in Malaysia and I have a new, a new hat now. So international, the International Vaccine Institute is an international organization that is uh, dedicated to global health that was uh, UN funded under a UNDP initiative in 1997. Uh, we, our HQ and labs are at, uh, um, in Seoul, uh, near the uh, Seoul University uh, campus. Um, we uh, have field programs in 29 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, we are 12 nationalities uh, in workforce of about 140 people. And uh, we are in the OECD recognized international organization, non for profit. And the first international organization in Korea, we are, uh, we have, we have 36 countries who are signatories of uh, IVI and WHO as state parties. Yeah. Um, our um, mission is really to, to develop, uh, to discover, develop and deliver and, and uh, provide uh, to do capacity building uh, in uh, the countries where we are wor working. Our mission is really to develop vaccines for the poorest in, in the world, mostly in, in what we call developing countries, low and middle income countries. Um, so we design, formulate new vaccines. We develop these vaccines uh, through techn tra technology transfer to manufacturers and partners in order to develop and commercialize these vaccines. And uh, uh, we also have an important activity of delivering the vaccine, just one thing, that is basic, but a vaccine doesn't save, only vaccination saves. So, so uh, that's, if you don't, don't deliver the vaccine to the people in need, uh, um, you are basically nowhere. And of course, capacity building is to ensure vaccine security and safe reliance in developing countries. So in the pipeline, we have historically, um, actively worked on cholera, oral cholera vaccine, also the IDT uh, typhoid conjugate vaccine. Uh, we have been uh, involved in another coronavirus uh, development uh, through a Gene One company uh, on MERS, and it was one, one phase one that was conducted in, in Seoul. 
We're also working on schizosomiasis vaccine, a non-typhoidal salmonella vaccine, hepatitis A, Shigella, TB, and uh, importantly, a uh, new global threat like chikungunya, and, and of course, recently, uh, um, uh, COVID-19. So for COVID-19 more specifically, we do not, uh, just one, one precision, we do not manufacture the vaccine, as I said, we operate through uh, collaborations with manufacturers. Um, we are in uh, preparing a phase one trial with Innovio, which is in the through public domain, so I can talk about it. The trial has not started yet, but we are preparing this trial in, uh, in Seoul University and um, um, hospital. Uh, we are still in the final preparations and agreements uh, to, to start this clinical trial. We have another uh, series of discussions ongoing with different uh, uh, companies. Uh, I cannot say anything because we are under non-disclosure uh, agreement uh, and the negotiations are progressing and we hope that we'll have other candidates to, to develop uh, soon uh, with them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Exer. And now, um, last but not least, uh, we have Mr. Nagler with us. Uh, Mr. Ingo Nagler is a biotechnologist by profession, and he is the co-founder and co-owner of BIA Separations. So I'd like to hand over the time now to uh, Mr. Nagler to, uh, to share a bit about himself um, as well as his company and the work they're currently doing. Yeah, Kesh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. So, uh, yeah, my name is Ingo Nagler, and uh, as Kesh mentioned, I'm a business development officer currently filling this role. Um, I'm uh, more than 20 years with this company. So we founded this company in uh, 1998 in, in the heart of Europe, actually, in Slovenia, pretty small uh, country. Um, and... Uh, Took the, took the technology from uh, the very beginning uh, to the market matureness. So we managed to solve the scaling up problem uh, thoroughly. Uh, this was the biggest uh, obstacle at, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, we are now scaling to the 20 liter. Um, so my, my job is practically dominated by market and technology intelligence uh, for the company. Uh, and I'm working, of course, uh, uh, very intensively at the interface uh, of our company's uh, product and product development teams and of our clients. So I'm trying to bring, in, to bring together, uh, let's say, technologi technological uh, intelligence from our side with the biological intelligence from, uh, for example, vaccine or ATMP uh, developing companies. So BIA is uh, really fully committed, and this from the very beginning, to provide technology solutions for the large complex molecules. We are really dealing laser focused on molecules, biomolecules, which are large in size. Uh, for example, AAV for the gene therapy, adenovirus uh, for viral vectors for vaccines, and uh, lately uh, heavily emerging uh, we, we are providing technology portfolio for the mRNA space and also for the plasma DNA space. So what we are doing uh, currently is uh, due to the extreme demand uh, we are facing, we are trying and doing it, uh, we are ramping up our manufacturing capabilities, uh, we are ramping up our process development space, uh, anywhere between uh, 2x and 5x within uh, one year to be able to help the community to bring better and hopefully successful approaches of uh, this pandemic vaccine to the market. So in parallel, we're also working uh, heavily on further process uh, enhancement of uh, existing, uh, let's say, PDNA process technology, and especially launching uh, uh, mRNA purification uh, portfolio, which is, uh, which is practically uh, the largest in the market. 
So besides this, we are also involved in uh, in uh, national COVID VLP, a Slovenian uh, COVID VLP project uh, to streamline the DSP. And at the end of the day, uh, hopefully many, many approaches will be successful to be able to uh, manage this pandemic and bring back life to normal. At the end of the at the end of uh, my of my introduction, I just want to say that uh, I, I really believe from the very beginning that monoliths will be the working horses of uh, the efficient uh, downstream processing of the large complex biomolecules. Uh, not only by bringing capacity and productivity, but especially uh, making no compromise on resolution, which is a marker number one for safety. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nagar. So now that we are all acquainted with each other, uh, let us begin the uh, panel discussion. So I wanna start off um, by asking, what are the challenges that you guys have faced um, you know, so far in your journey uh, to create a SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccine? You know, some of you are in the preclinical stage, uh, phase one, uh, gearing uh, for phase one, um, and CanSino Biologics is in their phase two. Uh, so I just wanna know uh, what, what are the challenges uh, that you guys are currently facing? Um, perhaps uh, we can start off with uh, Dr. Ella. Um, would you like to share a little bit about the journey uh, that you guys, uh, you went through uh, in terms of the preclinical studies, uh, how uh, the progress has been like, um, and the next steps for you? And if at all, uh, any challenges that were faced or are uh, being faced at the moment that you're in search for a solution? I mean, um, uh, when you have this pandemic, uh, these sort of things, major problem we encounter uh, is the re research reagents. Whether you want to make a DNA synthesis or you want to have vector construct or you want to have monoclonal antibody or polyclonal antibody, and those are not very available, that got delayed, a lot of things. I mean, it is too so, so suddenly it's happened. So it's all, all got the research reagent was there. Besides, what happened, even if it is available, the lockdown of logistics of transportation of the material from country to country has also blocked us. So that I think the totally choked us in both the way. Research reagent getting from uh, making people from the making that one and also transporting from that one place to another place was choked us. Because India, we doesn't have much animals also. Like you want yes to mice, we can't get it. So you want a monkey is also you can't get it. So we face different problem of animal. I mean, other countries may have a easier access to animal, but we have a less access to the animals in India. So we have multiple problems. That's the only problem otherwise. So uh, with respect to um, getting animals for your uh, preclinical study animal models, um, how have you uh, kind of uh, mitigated that uh, situation effectively? So so what we are doing is uh, some of the product we are sending it to US and getting animal testing done in US itself. Okay. So we're trying to mitigate uh, whether it's Madison or uh, Thomas Jefferson, wherever it is available, we're getting done the those tests in US. So okay. that's the only way to get the faster. Uh, currently the only way to only get way. it faster. Yes. yes. If it was, uh, you know, a something that uh, India could provide, then uh, do you believe that the timelines would be a lot shorter? Because I'm sure there's a lag between uh, getting it from the US. Yes, if those reagents, those infrastructure is available in India, and I think we'll be very aggressive. We'll be really, we'll be able to do very well. Uh, that is the one which is blocking us uh, because in vaccine manufacturing, we're very ahead of the game. But this research agent is choking us right now. And um, so how about the rest, uh, you know, have you uh, experienced similar challenges um, or perhaps some challenges that are unique uh, to your geography, you know, um, for China, um, for um, Jean-Louis, you, you would be um, familiar with the situation in Korea. 
um, I, I, I assume. So uh, perhaps, you know, uh, you could share. Well, uh, um, I would like to, to react to your first question that you, you uh, asked, uh, Dr. Ayla. I think, um, yes, we are in a unique uh, situation worldwide, uh, a, a tragedy, uh, incredible tragedy, unique for the century, I hope. Um, uh, from a health perspective, but also a societal and economic perspective. So there's been a flurries, and this is good, uh, flurries of vaccine approaches uh, from everywhere, from China, from India, from the US, from Europe, uh, e everywhere. So the, one of the key questions is how do you do you um, approach these vaccines and how do you rank them in order to, to make sure that uh, you are embarking into a, uh, a correct vaccine approach, a scientific platform? There are several. So which, which, who, what will be the winner? I don't know. Uh, we don't know, but uh, it's good that we have these several approaches and we, keep, we must keep in mind uh, that uh, phase one and two are fine when it comes to basic safety and reactogenicity and uh, immunogenicity, uh, um, yeah, tolerability and immunogenicity. But the key question is how we will deploy this vaccine for phase three? What would be the strategy for phase three? And what would be, this is where uh, we have to be also careful, and uh, that's why, uh, what Dr. Ella said, you know, these preclinical data are absolutely key to test uh, the, the safety of the vaccine, in particular for the potential uh, uh, harmful effect of uh, uh, the uh, strong immune response, and in particular, a TH2 response that may induce uh, a of pneumonia, eosinophilic, uh, eosinophilic pneumonia in the lung, or, or to develop uh, antibody dependent So these questions are absolutely key to answer in preclinical studies as much as we can. And that's why uh, one of the challenges, only, not only to have reagents, but also to have assays, lab assays that are standardized using the same format in order to compare the different results between between different companies and uh, and labs so that's another challenge and also when it comes to monkey experience challenge experiments to have also monkey experiment that are also standardized and there people are just using what they can use at the moment but there are some effort in particular in the us uh, harvard to standardize uh, immune uh, um, monkey challenge uh, platform that could be standardized in terms of uh, you know doses uh, required for the challenge and etc um, these are these are real true challenges and the, the biggest challenge is beyond phase one phase two and even phase three uh, but even for phase three uh, the large scale capa manufacturing capacity, that we will have to face if we want to distribute these vaccines to hundreds of millions of people. So how are we going to do that? That's why, um, in my perspective, one of the main challenges is, at the end of the day, would be whatever the vaccine would be, large-scale manufacturing and deployment of these vaccines in the people in need, in uh, the populations in need, and, and vaccine strategies. But that, that is a tremendous challenge. Nobody has the answer to this question, but you have probably seen recent papers uh, calling for massive collaboration between uh, all, all uh, across the, the strata of, of, of scientists and, and um, developers, manufacturers uh, to, to find solutions and public um, uh, decision makers. Um, to, to develop this vaccine. So we are in, in a unique situation. I think I, I don't recall that there was any example where even for HIV and HIV was another crisis uh, 
uh, World, World Health Crisis is still. Um, um, I don't think we, we have faced such an urgency and uh, an urgent need to have a vaccine. So this is part of the challenge. And we, I think also we must get uh, away from political considerations, vested interests, and we must collaborate. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Dr. Uh, Bin, yes. Yeah. yeah, I would like to uh, echo the two uh, speakers' uh, you know, opinions and comments. I am totally agree. This is a, a really massive, unprecedented uh, you know, the outbreak. Uh, even uh, we, uh, China has first detected the, 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 the outbreak and then nobody really expected their spreading so much and so quick and internationally. This is, a, uh, this is a one, uh, one of the example. We do need a, a international collaboration and uh, a international efforts. So the, you know, the virus is without board, border. That is the, one of the key uh, consideration. But that my uh, answer to uh, the challenge uh, question, I would uh, name three challenges from uh, my point of view. And the one would be the uh, re uh, research and the development uh, for the vaccine themselves. Second is uh, will be uh, 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 communication, including logistics. Uh, the third will be the uh, uh, how to uh, 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 how to um, uh, communicate with the uh, regulatory bodies and uh, for the you know IND filing, including how they will spinning up the uh, you know evaluation of uh, the products. So that is the three uh, major reason. And the one uh, from the research uh, perspective, we have a, a facing a similar challenge. And uh, India uh, may be different uh, challenge and uh, India face. We do have um, uh, animal available and uh, however, everybody try to uh, raising up and uh, competing each other. So uh, the, the P3 facility become a, a pressure uh, place and uh, for uh, fighting for the cage and the space and uh, you know, the, all the long queue and uh, you do one, research uh, group and then you have to wait for your second group and uh, maybe uh, two weeks apart. So this is the amazing uh, chaos and never experienced before. And also we have to uh, searching out the second resources and um, in, in case to us to save our uh, the time and uh, try to getting up the consistent results. And uh, uh, secondly is the, the animal challenge model, which is uh, required for our uh, CDE and the, the regulatory body. And uh, they're asking for a challenge. So we are looking for whether they can have a two uh, uh, major aspects. One is the can preventing infection uh, measured by the viral law. Secondly, whether they can stop uh, the the can uh, uh, re, uh, um, relieve the pathogenesis of the lung, and those two actually uh, the first one may be represented uh, by the challenge model is okay, but the secondly is not a, um, a not a very mimic to human disease. So that is a, a one of a problem. How you really. Uh, you value this is a challenge model and to see that's the efficacy and, uh, and will work in, in human people. So that's uh, one of the uh, big challenge. Secondly, and uh, that is the challenge with, uh, we are have an international collaboration with US partners. And the beginning we can able to travel to US to uh, directly, you know, to work together. And then suddenly the border closed. Everybody cannot travel freely. And uh, so you're all using Zoom and all the different media. And it's not the same thing anymore. So it's uh, become so restricted. And uh, that's a leading, you know, uh, so uh, that's a leading up uh, another problem. And the efficiency become a, a bigger problem. 
And uh, uh, so come to the second uh, communicate. So that's the lead to the communication. And uh, you know, in, in China and the uh, uh, partner with the uh, US, so we have, we're all working around the clock, but uh, you know, the different time zones, the still uh, uh, there have a problem, you know, either you have to wake up or we have to wake up. So, uh, so during the research group is not a single person, you know, two person is like a 10 more than 20 person in the group and the different locations that's uh, you know, you can imagine that's uh, how difficult and not everybody's, opinion can be expressed. So that's the uh, second, you know, we thought this is uh, sometimes is uh, really wasting uh, everybody's time and uh, uh, people could getting sleep because they're already overworked. And uh, so, but we have to wake up for, for meeting. So that's the uh, <laughs> communication. And the logistic is even more a uh, problem because when we try to shaping out our animal's blood, out of China to US to test, you know, there will be governmental issues and the paperwork and a lot of uh, stuff. And same, same uh, the same way US uh, shaping out uh, to us have also the logistic issue. And the later on even worse because all the fly are stopped. And uh, of course there is a, a passenger fly, uh, almost there is not. And uh, the, but the commercial or uh, cargo's uh, uh, fly is like a one a day. So that's the uh, uh, start to fighting, you know. You are competing with the, uh, the, the mask shaping and with your serum shaping and your DNA shaping. So that becomes so uh, unexperienced, uh, uh, amazing. And so that's the one of the tough thing and uh, we are experienced. Uh, the last one, uh, not the least, but uh, you have to work in with the governmental regulatory agencies because they're probably never experienced this a kind of an emergency situation. Even China government from whatever uh, higher level and uh, make a strong decision, we should have a, a national effort and uh, making um, the different technology, uh, vaccine technology to go parallel and also should be a special, uh, special uh, treatment uh, to evaluating uh, different uh, vaccine products. And however, the regular uh, third body really thinking, uh, really thinking is, uh, 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 yeah, really thinking uh, was, uh, you know, the safety is the most concerned, particularly when they saw the when they saw some pu previous publication, and uh, there will be like a ADE or vaccine enhanced disease, and making them more worried, more cautious. So they want to you're testing more uh, uh, safety related issues. So, so that has become you know when you, when you one hand the, you want to speak in up. Another hand, you want to have uh, making um, more systematic approaches uh, to make sure the safe. So that's has become so uh, uh, you know that's is a kind of a, a big challenge for us. So I will stop there, and uh, thank you. Um, actually, so uh, you did mention a few um, challenges that um, were. Uh, with relation to the lack or um, the strain on resources uh, in China. You know, you have the resources, um, but because everyone is vying for the resources, um, there's a strain put on that. So I'd, I'd like to understand if uh, Dr. Chu um, uh, echoes uh, similar challenges uh, that he faced, faced during his um, uh, his, his vaccine development efforts uh, up till phase two uh, clinical trial. Yeah, I think if I've, I've speak it out one with Janice, uh, I think maybe we are a little bit earlier than, than, than you guys. So we, we didn't have this kind of issue, like, uh, you know, uh, animals, results. Uh, only challenge for us is timing also different because uh, uh, before, you know, when we do vaccine development, you do step by step. 
So you pay the same bank, they go to like, you know, uh, we call the GLP production for tax, tax after tax, you do the GMP. But now we have to do all this simultaneously. That is challenging. And I remember, I, I can't remember which day, you see, you know, in the middle of, uh, I think in the 2 a.m., we have a product purified, and we do the analysis that we released. I think 6 a.m., we have uh, five group. One go to the Beijing Jolly, you know, we send for talk study. So they have monkey ready for us. 8, 8.30, they have injections. We have one group fly to Harbin, another P3 <coughs> labs, they do the monkeys, uh, uh, challenge studies. And we have another group who fly, uh, go to the Beijing lab. They have the, what is the uh, genetic mice? Uh, I forget names. They have to do the challenge studies. But anyway, uh, I think we may be a little earlier than Dr. Wang. So for us, I think we get a lot of support from different government uh, agencies, from the different uh, companies. Even the CDE also working very hard. Uh, we code them, they code us uh, in, in English called the ruling application. What that means every day, we have result, we have sent to them. So they review immediately and ask questions, ask new results, so we go back to new, <coughs> so everything like that. So it just, that's why like, you know, I think for last uh, three months, uh, most of our uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine group, a uh, lot of them like, uh, you know, sleep in the office because it has basically worked day and night, you no know, stop. Uh, currently, I think most the uh, biggest challenge is where we do our clinical trial, uh, clinical trial phase three, because we try to, we try to catch these uh, uh, waves. Uh, we don't know we can do it or not, because China for sure is, is no way we can do it. So we have to go to outside China. Uh, currently, we are working very hard with different countries. So, if we can, we have enough uh, good luck to, to, to find a place. Uh, for last time, uh, for the Ebola, we, we finished phase two, and then this, uh, uh, the, 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 how to say this, uh, 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 <clears throat> you know, this, uh, uh, the, the infection is finished. It's no more infection. So we can do phase three. I will hope this time we try to catch this. Uh, that's the biggest challenge so far we have. So I understand that um, having a sizable uh, sample size or patient pool also would be an issue, uh, you know, as uh, the curve uh, flattens in certain countries and, and, and other countries experience, you know, a second wave uh, or a third wave of, of infections. Uh, so um, how concerned are you um, with regards to this um, and how do you plan to um, Kind of mitigate this issue. It is a foreseeable, a foreseeable challenge. Uh, so I'd like to ask, um, you know, Dr. Uh, Ella, you know, how how, how do you, um, uh, what are your thoughts on this? The question, uh, Kashmira. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so, like Dr. Uh, Chu mentioned, you know, uh, sample size or uh, patient pool will uh, definitely be a consideration. Um, as you move on uh, for from your phase one to phase two, phase three uh, trials, and so as uh, you know, various countries experience um, flattening of the curve uh, or second and third waves of uh, infections. How do you um, foresee uh, the next steps for you to be? Well, I mean, uh, this question should be answered by Louis uh, because he's a clinician. Um, so what I will say is, uh, this is very good statistics uh, for safety. After that, you know, you want to look at the statistically what is the right population, uh, how you do the uh, the serology, and I think most important in this clinical sample is going to be uh, if you want to even don't have an efficacy, we can do even micro neutralization studies, confirm that yeah the live virus is getting neutralized with the sera from the human samples. And some of the vaccines have been done like that. Like a Japanese encephalitis, we don't challenge the people. We don't look at that, but we look at neutralization studies. So one can do uh, different strategies in uh, COVID uh, issues. Uh, it's not that, I mean, um, my other friend uh, panelist was talking about the, the catching up the efficacy, efficacy trial. 
uh, we can do it differently by looking at the uh, microneutralization studies in uh, sera samples. Uh, that is also allowed by the regulatory agencies uh, when you don't catch up this sort of thing. For example, Ebola, Merck vaccine is not being done a clinical trial. It's been approved. So, I mean, the, the, the regulatory agency can take certain decisions. And, uh, but the, certainly sample size, I think Dr. Lewis is the right person to answer the question. Uh, Dr. Exeller, do, uh, do you have anything to you know, add on? Um, yeah, I would like to, to comment a little bit on, on, on that. First is that uh, you are probably aware that WHO is working on a template of a, of a phase three efficacy trial. Um, this is not final and is open for comments. So uh, if we have a the lower the incidence that you could expect in a population, the higher the sample size, that's very basic. But uh, at the moment, it is true, and this is fortunate that we are flattening the curve and uh, hopefully getting to no new infection. But the virus is there around, and I do expect that, and we have already examples, you know, we have flares. Are there just a ripple or uh, the beginning of a new wave? We don't know. Uh, there have been a flare recently uh, in, in Korea, you have heard, uh, in Wuhan as well. And um, there, are, um, there are possibilities that in, in, in the US, for example, where you have an incredible number of, of cases still because people uh, are uh, going out and not self-distancing as we would, we would wish they do or not wearing masks. Um, there is a possibility that clinical trials in the US or Europe may be easier uh, than in Asia. Uh, but uh, I would be very prudent uh, and, and say that there is still a possibility that we may have a second wave in Asia as well, because we are still in the period of unlocking, uh, lifting the, the lockdown and uh, for example, in Malaysia, uh, there are very few cases, that's good. But uh, this is Ramadan. At the end of Ramadan, there will be another two weeks where people at the end of Ramadan will get together, you know, to celebrate Eid, etc. But what would be the situation after the, uh, the lift, the complete lift of, of the, the lockdown? We don't know. And, and, and what I say for Malaysia is true for any other country with lockdown. Unlocking. Uh, in France, for example, they are also unlocking, lifting the, the lockdown, but in a, in a very stepwise manner. What would be the effect? We don't know. So I think my take on this, and, and of course, in Africa, look at, uh, look at the, uh, the epidemic in South Africa. Look at the epidemic now I just heard today in Mozambique, uh, in Tanzania, in Tanzania. So the, it is going up. In, in Africa. Um, my take on this is that we probably would have to do multi-country trials. And uh, that's maybe the only way, first to be prepared with a vaccine in the vial, really to be used for large scale deployment, probably uh, in multi-country trials. So when you say it's not possible in China, uh, yeah, at the moment it's not possible, but in the future, maybe it would be possible if you have a, a new wave. Um, it's probably true for, for any other country, like big countries like India. Um, so I would see uh, that as, a, um, again, a collaborative effort on multi-centric, multi-country trials. I don't think that any company, any institution, any vaccine, can be tested just for itself um, in one country. I think this model is probably not valid. And uh, there are probably the new vaccine trial designs to, to think about with adaptive trial designs um, where we would be able to test several vaccines at the same time because uh, the investments that, require, that are required for such massive clinical trials are immense. The money flows at the moment, but uh, 
maybe people will change their mind. Uh, and it is true, so that we will have to, to talk to regulatory people. I totally agree uh, with Dr. Ayla and uh, Dr. Dr. Bean uh, that uh, regulatory uh, are absolutely essential in this discussion. We cannot start phase three trials um, and uh, operate nickel designs in communities without the approval of the, the understanding of the community. Uh, the people and also of the regulatory bodies. These are absolutely essential for success of such strategies. So it's it's, it's a very complex, multi multi uh, in, uh, unknown, uh, multifactorial equation, and I don't have the answer to 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 all. But this is how I, I see the future of efficacy trials. But the one thing that is important you mentioned. And, and this is maybe for the selection of the country where you do your phase one, two trials. I think phase one is relatively simple. Uh, phase two, you can, you can maybe orient your efforts in countries where you have more chances to have a second wave. And the countries where you have more chances of a second wave is the countries where you have no testing because there is no tracing of the people who, or you don't know the, the fraction of people who are susceptible and those who are not susceptible. This is the, the great uh, lesson of Korea. They have done an incredible uh, testing effort and they can trace the people to control. But there are many people, many other countries where for one infection, where very few uh, tested. Um, so we don't know, uh, the proportion of people who are negative and of people who are positive, either from previous infections or asymptomatic, previous symptomatic infections or asymptomatic. And, and this is a, a key element uh, from epidemiologists and uh, police, uh, health authorities to, to have transparency about these testing and disseminate testing in order to, to have a, a good idea of where what what are the chances of the second wave in a country? And so I would say if there is a such country identified, I would probably orient my efforts in these countries. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Exler, for uh, the insights. Um, I, I'd like to actually uh, pause here and um, ask Ingo um, a question. I understand you're currently working on the Simultis uh, Monoliths technology, and I wanted to understand how you envision uh, this technology to aid in the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development efforts. Um, I didn't get all the question due to audio uh, issues. Could you please, rem uh, could you please uh, ask again? Sure. Um, so my question was, um, with regards to your work uh, on the Simultis Monolith uh, technology, um, how do you envision uh, this technology aiding SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development efforts? Yeah, I mean, in principle, it's, uh, yeah, it's the, the, the most challenging task for us yeah, is uh, to bring in uh, the productivities we will need. And I believe that uh, the monoliths are really poised to do exactly like this. Um, in, the, in the upcoming presentation, uh, uh, I, will, I will outline a little bit uh, on, on, on the amounts which will have to be produced. And uh, as, my, uh, uh, speakers as the speakers before mentioned, we are talking about massive amounts. So we really need to put in place technology which is uh, Able to, man able to manage these amounts. I mean, only if you're talking about uh, plasmid DNA uh, approaches. If you're talking, if, if, if you wish, uh, 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 talk about, let's say, uh, vaccines for a population of 100 million, we are talking of uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of kilogram pure substance. Um, and this with a one milligram estimated dose per patient. So um, it, this, is the, this is one of the challenging uh, things which, I, which we believe monoliths will really uh, help uh, the community. 
On the other side, uh, it's um, about our total technology portfolio. And uh, uh, we see them in, in process development uh, uh, projects, we see a lot of challenging uh, situations coming in in a very early stage yeah, by um, inconsistent upstreams. Yeah? So the variabilities of the upstreams, uh, they, are lead, they are leading consequently to variabilities in the downstream. And what this means is that this leads to changes in impurity profiles. And at the end of the day, the change in impurity, pro impurity profiles, they finally end up at, in safety issues. So what I want to point out is that uh, our downstream solutions uh, work ex works extremely efficient. As long as uh, the upstream is extremely well controlled, there's a little bit of lag here. So this is the reason why BIA um, is considering the upstream, if you wish, as a first step of downstream. As such, uh, we have uh, invested uh, many, many years of development into, um, let's put it this way, fast adline HPLC PET strategy, so process analytical technology strategies for, um, uh, if you wish, a more holistic assessment of the impurity profiles uh, from the very beginning in process development. So uh, this is, this is uh, where the contribution of monoliths will kick in preparatively and uh, very important, uh, comprehensive analytically. So, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Nagler. So I think um, I, I have a presentation uh, that Mr. Nagler had put together to share with you guys um, a little bit more about his technology and, and how uh, possibly that could help you guys um, or help the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development efforts uh, ongoing. So um, I will share that presentation right now. And after that, we'll have our Q&A segment uh, where our viewers have uh, been sending in quite a few questions. Uh, so we will have that after the presentation. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Ingo Nagler. I'm a co-founder and business development officer at Bia Separations, a company fully dedicated to develop and manufacture novel bioprocessing tools for the purification and analytics of large complex biomolecules. In this presentation, I will give you an overview of emerging COVID-19 vaccines in the context of purification challenges and solutions. COVID-19 crisis is dramatically displaying the need to expedite vaccine development in order to mitigate national, regional, and global uncertainties and fear. Failure to do so may result in severe depression of global economics and massive threat for welfare and social balance. Novel strategies, vaccine strategies, are emerging Vaccines based on nucleic acids, viral vectors like adenovirus or adeno-associated virus. This situation and its dimension call for the most innovative and productive bioprocessing tools available. Having a look at the novel vaccine candidates, one feature stands out, namely the size of the biomolecules. We are talking of extremely large, complex molecules, and this feature makes them ideal candidates to be processed monoliths, analytically and preparatively. And I'm going to show you why. First of all, monoliths are produced in a single piece structure with an open flow channel network. There are no dead end pores. To understand the mechanism of action of monoliths, the following points are essential. The separation path is continuous. There is no stacking. There is no picking. There is no void. The mass transfer 
is purely convective. There are no diffusional limits. Flow properties in the monolith are laminar. There is no turbulent mixing and no shear stress. This slide gives you an overview which applications may be dominated by monoliths in the future. The larger and more complex future biologics get, the more monoliths will take over the leading role by design. To sum it up, in the context of purification of large complex molecules, such as vaccines, monoliths outperform any other chromatographic concept in the market by providing the following three factors, capacity and speed and resolution. Regarding resolution, one thing I have not mentioned yet is that novel vaccines also bring along novel sets of impurities. It's therefore mandatory in order to provide safe vaccines to also thoroughly manage those critical process and product related impurities. Monoliths are designed to do just that. Plasma DNA is one of the fastest emerging novel vaccine candidates. Published clinical protocols suggest dosing in the low milligram range per patient. For COVID-19, immense quantities would be needed. We are talking of hundreds of kilograms per 100 million doses. As such, a 40-liter production Simaltos monolith looks to be optimal to accomplish such goal. Simultus units come prepacked and can be used like stainless steel units. No worries about using harsh conditions for cleaning or sanitation in place procedures. 20, 30, 50 cycles and more may be run with proper cleaning procedures in place. Important, robust removal of critical sets of impurities like pDNA, isoforms, endotoxin, RNA and DNA are achieved by following a generic protocol. For your reference, monoliths are already used in a, in a manufacture of a gene thera therapy product in Japan, commercially. mRNA vaccines are emerging quickly as they intrinsically offer fast onset of antigen expression in the human body. Dosings are estimated to be in the low and mid microgram range. So for the COVID-19 application, we're again talking of several kilograms for a population of for 100 million. Simultus eight liter units may be perfectly suited to accomplish this task. The most critical sets of impurities are reported to be double strand RNAs. BIA has developed three different chemistries and protocols to fully solve this problem. The separations mRNA tools already used for the production of dozens of clinical batches to date. VLPs are anticipated also be serious vaccine candidates, especially when expressed in mammalian or insect cell lines, displaying the relevant glycan structures on its surfaces. Beer Separations has great experience with purification of VLPs and is, in, and is also contributing its analytical and preparative expertise within a national Slovenian COVID VLP project. Earlier work on HIV VLPs conducted by a third university party in Austria validated the potential of monoliths in terms of productivity already some five or six years ago. One of the latest strategies suggested by gene therapy pioneer Luc van der Berge from Grusbeck Gene Therapy Center, Harvard Medical School. He suggested using AAV, adeno associated virus, to deliver COVID gene sequence as a vaccine. Preparation of clinical trials are already in progress. AAVs are considered harmless viruses, extensively used in gene therapy for example, as gene replacement. 
For such applications, monoliths are again perfectly suited for capturing and polishing step in a nearly generic setting. Polishing step is extremely important, not only for depleting chromatin-related impurities, but especially for the most delicate separation task, the separation of full AV capsids from empty AV capsids and their aggregates. Monoliths are already the worldwide gold standard for exactly this application. At the end, I would like to show you an example of a powerful influenza downstream process intensification program run a few years ago. This work has been performed in the cooperation between beer separations and Blue Sky Immunotherapeutics, Vienna, Austria. Blue Sky took care about the upstream process development. Beer handled the downstream process development. To make the long story short, mission was, ex was accomplished successfully. We managed to develop a purification platform for many influenza serotypes, if not all. We managed to develop a process with as few as possible unit operations. We achieved extremely high host cell DNA and protein removal in a single step. To select, we selected the right chemistry for the maximum binding capacity. We exploited the monolith, in, monolith intrinsic features for maximum productivity. And we managed to align elution conditions with formulation requirements. Several batches have already been successfully produced on the basis of this process. With this, I would like to thank you now for your attention and hope that our joint efforts will finally not only help combating the current COVID-19 pandemic, but also lay the groundwork for fast and effective technologies for future challenges. Please contact us for all your further questions and technical inquiries. Looking forward to hearing from you. And stay away from Corona and stay safe. Thank you, Mr. Nagler, for that very interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to ask if the other uh, panelists have any uh, questions for Mr. Nagler with regards to, uh, you know, his work. I just want to ask uh, Nagler, um, for the light, if you are working with the inactivated vaccine, the one-step purification, what do you suggest? Could you, could you please uh, ask again? It's, uh, just it's a just a live inactivated vaccine. So just a BPL inactivated, you want to purify it, the one-step purification. What matrix you recommend? <laughs> that's, a, that's a question which really requires the scouting, uh, the thorough scouting of the technologies, uh, the scouting of uh, ion exchange columns or other options. Um, it's not a quick shot. It's always the combination of thorough analytical scouting and then transfer it to uh, the scale-up situation. So unfortunately, there is no, no easy answer to this point, but uh, the manifest, let's put, it, let's put it this way. If you provide us with a sample, we will do the job. I can't provide your live virus to you. <laughs> <laughs> We can't provide you live virus, so it's a difficult. Yeah, I mean, uh, the live virus. Yeah. Well, you know, um, in, in certain corporations, uh, we are employing or we started up to employ upstream operations in our company. So um, we anticipate to do this even more often just for uh, being able to do what you, what you mentioned, providing, let's say, live virus feedstock. You have anything equivalent to cellophane sulfate? Cellophane sulfate? Did I, did I hear it yes, correctly? Yes, yes, yes. Cellophane 
cellophane. Uh, this is a this is a cellulose a cellulose based uh, sulfated uh, chromatography media. Correct. Right. It's just an affinity matrix, some sort of. For the envelope of virus, it binds very well. Yeah, exactly. This is a pretty old technology and a very, very useful one. Absolutely, absolutely agree with you. Um, we would uh, probably you would go on a sulfonyl uh, chemistry uh, with our with our technology. Thank you, Nagla. Thank you. Thank you. Very welcome. Uh, is there any other question? Yeah, can I ask uh, Nagla? Uh, any any company has uh, using your monolith? to uh, purify uh, plasmid DNA and submit it uh, for R&D and the clinical trials. Yes. That, uh, yeah, I'll be, uh, uh, anything you can share about it? Um, at least I can share that one gene therapy plasmid is conditionally approved in Japan using our technologies. Um, and uh, probably I'm, uh, and for sure, I'm able to disclose that uh, our products are used for, I would say, dozens, if not two dozens of uh, manufacturing of clinical batches. Yes. All the regu regulatory support files are, of course, in place. Um, scalability goes from, uh, let's say, the scouting from 1 ml up to currently uh, eight, 8 liter and very soon to the 40 liter. Yes. So we are meeting, just, just maybe another point, we are meeting all the criteria necessary um, in terms of isoform uh, purity, so super cold purity. We meet all the, all the necessary uh, requirements uh, for endotoxin removal. And of course, uh, uh, host cell DNA and RNA as well as protein removal. Please approach us and we can discuss uh, even more thoroughly. Okay, Great. thank you. Great. Very thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nagler. Uh, so now I'd like to move on to the Q&A segment. Uh, we've had quite a lot of questions come in from uh, the viewers. So I'm going to start with the first question for, um, for Dr. Dongshu Chu. Uh, Dr. Chu? Uh, Dr. Chu, are, are you there? Hmm. Okay, um, I think there is a bit of a technical difficulty uh, on Dr. Chu's side. So um, let us uh, continue with a different question first. Um, one of uh, the questions that were sent in was with regards to the choice of vaccine injection system. Um, so uh, perhaps Dr. Bin Wang, have you given any thought uh, into uh, the choice of in, uh, vaccine uh, delivery system? Uh, and you know, for what reasons have you decided to use this method? And uh, how do you plan uh, to test and uh, move forward with the clinical trials given uh, this choice of uh, vaccine delivery? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. And uh, I think uh, the DNA vaccine normally giving a, a, a you know, needle syringe injection uh, follow up by the electroporation. And that's the procedure and a little bit uh, different from a regular uh, vaccine per se, like, uh, you know, cured or protein based uh, other type of a vaccine. This is the only uh, required for DNA vaccine for such to enhance uh, DNA vaccines uh, efficiency to enter the cell. Since the DNA vaccine themselves is not, uh, is not antigen, they're required to enter the cell and the nuclear and to express and translate in, you know, the transcribed and the translate into the protein antigen and then allow the cell to, uh, to present it to the immune system. So in such a way, you are the DNA vaccine and uh, enter the cell, it become a 
a challenge. Uh, in the early days, uh, when we using a needle to uh, just simply apply the DNA into the uh, people or uh, um, animal, and you will find a very low efficiency uh, to stimulating immune response regarding humoral and the cellular uh, immune responses. And then later on, Inovio had take a, 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 you know, taking advance of the electroporation technology and uh, to, uh, in vitro and then uh, into in vivo system. And in, in, in that uh, apply to the DNA vaccine and making uh, the DNA vaccine suddenly uh, enhance the uh, uh, expression efficiency uh, by at 1000 fold. And so, and in human, then we suddenly find, uh, you know, the uh, uh, several DNA into the clinical trials has a, a very good uh, uh, stimulation uh, regarding humoral and uh, and uh, cellular immune responses. And those are the uh, level of the stimulation act actually is very comparable. Uh, compared to a uh, uh, different form modality of uh, uh, vaccine uh, compared with uh, uh, protein based and compared to a uh, uh, viral uh, vector based. Uh, but with one of the uh, important advantages is the DNA, DNA plasmid themselves do not have, uh, do not have uh, uh, do not have uh, uh, immunity uh, or the host do not raise uh, immune response against the plasmid themselves. So, uh, uh, so in that way, so you can give him a multiple uh, repeating dose uh, without uh, uh, see the decline of the, uh, the decline of the immune response rather than you are boosting the immune response. So that's uh, uh, when you when you compare with the viral vector based vaccine. So that is uh, one of the right, advantage. Um, and Dr. Uh, Exceller, how about you? Uh, has uh, there been a choice of a vaccine delivery system? Uh, and if so, uh, you know, uh, why, uh, why was that choice made and how do you plan to uh, go about testing? Well, you know, the, the classical um, ways of uh, route of administration of vaccines are traditionally intramuscular with or without electroporation. Um, the other ways, and I think there was a uh, allusion um, either from Dr. Bin Wang or Dr. Dong, Dong Su, uh, uh, or maybe Dr. Ella, I don't remember, about uh, intranasal uh, administration, which is also a, a possible uh, uh, way of administration. And the, the third uh, that is being tested is microneedle patch um, vaccine, which is also an interesting uh, way. Um, I think we have, you know, the scientific part of this uh, routes of in administration. We must also keep in mind the practical aspects of delivering massively, uh, deploying this vaccine worldwide and in large scale. So intramuscular injection, we know that uh, we have already used it for millions and billions of children uh, <clears throat> already. So this is a proven system. Um, intranasal would be fine and we, we have example of, uh, of polio that is used uh, intranasal. Oh, um, sorry, yeah, not intranasal, I'm sorry, uh, oral. But uh, we, we have, there are vaccines that, that are used intranasal. Uh, for example, flu mist, uh, vaccine against flu. So, which is a, a good example of an intranasal vaccine. Um, the others are more experimental and we don't have any, any, uh, any data on, on this kind of, of approaches. I think, you know, the most probable will, will still remain intramuscular, maybe intranasal, um, assuming that again, uh, 
we satisfy the safety, immunogenicity, etc. That we don't know yet. Thank you, Dr. Exceller. Uh, another question uh, that was posed uh, to Dr. Chu. Um, how did you arrive on the dose of your candidate vaccine for the uh, challenge study in monkeys? And what was the main uh, root of the challenge? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, uh, we can hear you. Okay, I think most uh, experience we come uh, uh, we get from uh, our another vaccines called the, the Ebola. You know, one we do is is uh, exactly the same technologies and the very similar dosage. So we that's why you know we can develop this so fast. So we use almost exactly the same technology, very similar dosage. So we just directly go to the uh, you know go to the monkeys and then uh, after monkeys uh, everything's okay. We start human. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I, I just wanted to uh, also elaborate on that. Um, has the experience with other infectious uh, diseases such as Ebola or SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, uh, has that uh, supplemented uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccine development? Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, Dr. Ella, how, how about you? Do you feel that um, because of your prior experience, uh, has that supplemented, uh, you know, your vaccine development efforts? I mean, um, when you're working with inactivated vaccine, we get some sort of uh, guess estimates and we do some dirty experiment before coming out at dose. So we do small mice study, look at the neutralization, check whether it is working against uh, neutralizing studies or not. Based on that, we just immediately jump onto the dosage. And also we look at the convalescent patient samples and we look at that, how much is IgG is produced in that, will it neutralize this much virus or not? So we get some idea from that. And also previous experience of uh, inactivated vaccine like chikungunya, Zika, gives you some how to correlate three to three animal convalescent patient and then uh, your uh, micro neutralization assay all put together, we get an idea of, uh, and of course, the publication from Chinese also helps us to uh, reconfirm the, some of our ideas. Thank you, Dr. Ella. Um, so we have another question that uh, was posed. Um, earlier, some challenges uh, with regards to sending sam samples to collaborators were um, highlighted. And so how was this uh, successfully managed uh, is the, the question or what the viewers would like to understand. I believe uh, Dr. Ella, you did mention yeah. it as well as Dr. Uh, Bin Wang mentioned uh, right. this issue. Mm. I mean, uh, we explored, see earlier we had um, get uh, from US consignment in less than two days or three days max. Now it's taking 10 days. So you need to plan two weeks before now. And uh, you need a world courier, so many other logic. FedEx Express cannot do the cold storage. So a lot of hurdles. And I think at least a world courier is start of operating right now and solve some of the problem. But otherwise it's still, uh, you get a nothing but the blood pressure nowadays, nothing else. So. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Uh, Bin Wang, um, you mentioned that, uh, you know, with the flight suspensions, um, you know, you also uh, face some hurdles with the logistics aspect. So perhaps you can share how you are also, uh, you know, overcoming this uh, challenge with sending samples to collaborators. And, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, we, in early days, and uh, we experienced that uh, hurdle. And, uh, and then we have uh, support from local government and, uh, and also the customer uh, office, or, uh, office. And then we file the uh, contingent uh, plan. And those is all related to the vaccine development for COVID-19. And then they start to alert. And this is the helping, really helping us to pre-fill all the paperwork. And uh, we scheduled our shipping uh, advance uh, in, for the day 
and then they will know when they're starting to process. So that's uh, uh, making very easier later on. So uh, currently we have like a file today, then we will able to uh, shipping out uh, by tomorrow. And, uh, but uh, the logistically, you're still fighting for the cargo space. And uh, since, you know, China shipping out a lot of uh, medical equipment out and then you, uh, and, uh, and some in. So you have to uh, fighting for that. So you need uh, like a two weeks uh, plan to reserve the space for you. So that's just, uh, how, once you find out the way how to do it, then become easier, much easier than early days. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wang. Um, there's a question uh, for Dr. Exler um, with regards to uh, the stability of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit about um, how uh, the stability issue is being tackled uh, towards a significant immunogenicity performance of the vaccine. So uh, uh, if I understand the question correctly, are you talking about the, the, the stability of the virus itself uh, over time, the evolution of the virus? Yes, uh, the question seems to be uh, with regards to the virus, yes, uh, regarding the stability of the virus and how yeah. that uh, contributes to significant immunogenicity performance of the vaccine. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Um, that's an important question. So there has been a, a recent uh, a recent paper from Betty Colbert um, analyzing a number of strains from around the world and discovering that the SARS-CoV the more he multiplies, the more he has chances of experiencing mutations. And there are mutations that are happening in some strains. And some of these strains are taking over the previous strain uh, in some areas. So this is uh, something that we have to keep in mind when we test uh, neutralization uh, with a given vaccine, uh, vaccine-induced neutralization in animals or in, in humans, we have to test this neutralization capacity uh, against different strains, including the latest strains that are circulating and maybe take over. So uh, the moral of the story is that in addition to that, you have in parallel to monitor regularly uh, by very experienced labs uh, the uh, and the Los Alamos uh, lab, for example, of Betty Colver, the uh, the molecular biology dynamics of the virus over time in different parts of the world. This is something that is absolutely key. Uh, look, the example of flu. You know that flu is mutating. Uh, you also know that HIV has been mutating. And uh, what is true for one vaccine uh, against the certain strains may not be true the next year for flu vaccine against new strains. That's why we have to make flu vaccines every year. So whether we, we are not there in this situation for, for COVID, um, I don't want to be alarmed. I just want to flag that we must monitor uh, the molecular epidemiology uh, um, dynamic uh, of this of this virus, and test uh, the human, new animal, and human samples for neutralization and binding antibodies as well against the new strains that are circulating. Uh, thank you, Dr. Exeller. Um, so we have another question. Uh, with regards to the approach uh, so far, it's been rather reactive, uh, especially since uh, this is the first time we have seen such a pandemic. So uh, moving forward, how would you envision um, a proactive approach towards vaccine development, as well as you know how governments uh, probably can plan uh, for better uh, pandemic preparedness? Um, because with respect to uh, infectious diseases, uh, there's definitely in the future uh, going to be another one. 
Uh, and so how, how are we going to deal with that? So uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Exeller, you could uh, share a bit about that. If you have the question, if you have a response to this question, call me. But that's a, a too too to be serious. Um, I think there are, you, you have seen that there have been tremendous efforts. Uh, CEPI is one of these, is maybe the, the first effort that has been consented, this collaboration uh, uh, for preparedness, uh, uh, emergency preparedness uh, innovation is remarkable. And uh, my way to congratulate uh, CEPI for their, their effort. And the, the money, the, the funds that they are they are raising through through uh, different governments, and mostly the, the EU. Uh, there is another effort that has just been uh, made public that is called Active, and uh, this is a paper in Science uh, two or three days ago uh, from uh, the first author is Larry Corey, John Mascola, uh, Barney Graham, and Tony Fauci. Who have, um, but this is very U.S. U.S. Uh, focused. Um, who are calling for a, a a real collaborative effort of all the sectors in order to come with a master plan, not individual plans, but a master plan of tackling uh, uh, vaccine uh, vaccine COVID vaccine developments. And uh, and uh, clinical trials and, and deployment and uh, of course manu manufacturing uh, and deployment and uh, manufacturing is a is a big chunk of it but uh, these are brilliant ideas difficult to put in place but we have to have the political will um, to to collaborate together um, this this willingness is absolutely key without it we would not be able to achieve anything really substantial even you know if tomorrow you say oh uh, my vaccine is great in the use of neutralizing our disease okay but you are still nowhere you have just data and if you don't have a master plan in place you will not be able to progress so that's uh, that's an important point um and this is an important point to convey to the media, through the media, and to help uh, to ask uh, the media to convey to the communities, to the, you know, the public at large. This is a complex task, huge task for everyone. In addition to that, I think I can't see the deployment of a vaccine uh, before yeah, 18 months to two years from now. So in between, what do you do? I think we have to continue all our efforts that we're doing now, all the countries worldwide are, are trying to do with uh, more or less success. But, uh, and even if a vaccine is deployed, that's basically the message that we had for HIV vaccines. If tomorrow you had an HIV vaccine, this is not the end. This is an HIV vaccine plus a comprehensive prevention package. And I think for coronavirus, it's gonna be the same. We need to have a comprehensive prevention package. Vaccines would be a tool, perhaps monoclonal antibodies as well. And of course, all the therapeutic uh, uh, gallery of, of products, uh, hopefully that will be successful. But uh, that's why, I, I, I see it and uh, you know, uh, we are all humans. We have families, we have children, grandchildren and, and we are working for them. So we have to think about the future and not the immediate uh, vaccine world only, but global picture. Definitely. Um, how about uh, Dr. Ella, perhaps uh, you can uh, share your thoughts on how we can move forward with a proactive uh, approach. Um, hope, I, I know it's tough, um, but uh, given the impact that COVID-19 has had on um, 
of people's health, economy. Um, perhaps you know you can advise or share your thoughts on how you think we can move forward with a more proactive approach. I think um, uh, Kashmir, you said rightly how the economy gets affected. The pandemic is not killing too many people. I mean, it's killing people, but it's most important is destroying the economy. The you know entire airline industry, hospitality, everything is destroyed. I think that's important. And I think what a, uh, people should do it, even a smart, most of the neglected diseases are turned out to be pandemic. And most of the pandemic disease starts from the developing world. Okay, and from Africa or Asia, it starts from there. So what do we do as a countries, all of the developing world countries? I think we should have even a smallest incident occurs anywhere. If it occurs in India, I think somebody should share immediately. Whether it is a, even it doesn't have any commercial value, we should just share it. Let the country take a decision, is it going to be important or not? And I think if you bring that type of awareness among the countries, among the society, among the institutes, just share whatever information you found and observe of a smallest one. Today's uh, small problem will become a global problem. And we neglect that small issue. And I think we should think that smallest issue will be a problem and immediately alert it to the globally. Hey, we saw that this problem, it's occurred here in this small county and take a note of it. And I think, you know, it's a country's to take a policy decision, okay, whether to work or not. And also second point is the country also should have a pandemic expert who has got expertise on monoclonal antibody and vaccine expertise and handling certain strategic thinking. And uh, they, every country should have now pandemic expert, like economic advisor for each country has got. Now you need a pandemic advisor for each country and should talk among themselves and how do we position these sort of strategies for the future point of view? Yep. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ella. You know, um, we've had quite a lot of questions come in, but um, in the interest of uh, time, uh, we'll be wrap wrapping up this uh, Q&A session. So thank you everyone for addressing some of the queries that our viewers had. And this has been a fruitful discussion. And to our viewers, I hope that you managed to glean some insights um, into the questions that you had. Uh, with regards to all the questions that came in, uh, we will be sending out um, responses uh, to uh, you via email. Uh, you know, so then um, not to worry, uh, you know, your questions will be addressed. Uh, it's just uh, with this, uh, in, in the interest of time, uh, we'll be wrapping up for now. So before we wrap up today's session, I'd like to take a moment to highlight two of our upcoming interviews, uh, namely on the topic of tackling real-time monitoring challenges, um, which will be on the 21st of May and on the topic of developing standardized animal models to evaluate SARS-CoV-2 vaccine effectiveness, which will be on the 28th of May. If you're keen to register, uh, please do so uh, using the link on your screen or email me uh, to discuss further. In addition, we have compiled a market research uh, report on the vaccines targeting coronaviruses, uh, namely COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, uh, as well as the MERS-CoV uh, MERS vaccines. So I'd like to invite my colleague, uh, Sumuki, to share a little bit about this report with you. It was a pleasure hosting you at uh, IMAPAX Corona 360 in conversation. I really hope you enjoyed the session earlier. I'm uh, Sumuki Srivatsan. I represent the Market Intelligence uh, Division at IMAPAC. Uh, since most of you are associated with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development, I thought this uh, would be very useful for you. Uh, so basically, my team and I have been tracking the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development uh, through in-depth industry uh, research with uh, 
key vaccine manufacturers and we've come up with a comprehensive uh, coronavirus vaccine pipeline report. So the report basically covers about 150 organizations that are working on um, MERS, SARS, as well as SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Uh, we've performed company-wise and regional analysis of the R&D pipeline, the clinical trial timelines, uh, the vaccine platform. <clears throat> uh, we've also tried to understand the company's uh, manufacturing capacity planning, what would be their uh, future expansion plans. We've actually done this for about 90 organizations that, um, uh, that are working uh, on SARS-CoV-2 uh, and uh, for about 60 organizations that are working on SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV vaccine development. Then apart, we've also carried out uh, you know, surveys and opinion analysis with veterans in the vaccine industry to get their feedback on the major factors that they think are, are currently hindering the development of a viable vaccine. Uh, we've also tried to um, uh, you know, get feedback from, from the veterans on you know, the most promising vaccine type that's currently available. We've tried to find out market sentiments about which vaccine is going to enter the market first. This is going to be an mRNA vaccine or is it going to be another type of vaccine that's going to come to the market first. Um, this apart, we've also tried to understand the clinical trial timelines uh, from these experts. Um, so popular market uh, popular market sentiments and executive insights derived through comprehensive primary research with key stakeholders have been covered uh, in this report currently uh, providing solutions to the vaccine industry or if you're a vaccine uh, developer yourself and you're looking for detailed pipeline assessment with regards to the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine pipeline. Um, but, you know, please, uh, feel, uh, please download our report preview. I've provided the link. Uh, here, uh, or if you're if you're interested in uh, Imapac's other reports, or if you're looking at uh, you know bespoke reports to be done, please feel free to write to us at uh, marketintelligence@imapac.com. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm looking forward to uh, meeting you all in the next Corona 360 in conversation. Bye bye. Um, thank you, uh, Sumuki. Uh, that brings us to the end of MAPEG's first live moderated interview. I'd like to thank our panelists, Dr. Bin Wang, Dr. Ella, Dr. Chu, Dr. Exceller, and Mr. Nagler, uh, for taking the time out to uh, join us and share their thoughts on this pertinent topic. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to BIA Separations uh, for being our goal sponsor for this interview. And last but not least, I'd like to thank you, our viewers, uh, for spending your afternoon tuned in to this interview. I hope that you found the session insightful and I hope that you'll be tuning in to our future interviews as well. Till then, have a great day ahead and stay safe.